Okay. So I'm Megan Isidore. I am the um, uh, co-founder and the director of the River Otter Ecology Project. We started 11 years ago in 2012. So we have been working very hard on understanding the role of river otters in the Bay Area and beyond since then. And the role that river otters have, and the reason that we're so interested in them, is because their lives and their lives in the San Francisco Bay Area are all about connections. And those are connections among water, land, other species, humans, the whole web of interactions that makes our planet. Now, I'm an ecologist and a conservationist, and I follow those pathways and try to spend my time exploring that web that connects all of us. And our mission is, of course, to support our planet's health. And there we go. So we are very grateful to be connected to you through Zoom today, and we're and also through our mission to support watershed health, connecting otter health with watershed conservation and uh, restoration. And we do that in three ways, through community science, through research, through education, and we use all of that to advocate for, um, for ri river otter, uh, sorry, I'm admitting someone, for, um, we use all of that to advocate for watershed conservation. We're also very grateful to the Coast and the Bay Miwok, the Wapo, Pomo, and the Ohlone tribes for stewarding the unceded land that we live in and work on for their soul deep understanding of those connections that we're talking about through millennia. And those are the, those are the connections that we try to honor and emulate. Now, why is my slide not going? There we go. So how did all this start? This once upon a time, there were river otters all over the Bay Area. Historically, they were here, but by the 20th century, their numbers had dwindled to very few. The otter sightings were less frequent and then they completely disappeared in many, many parts of the Bay Area. And our story tonight is about the adorable cuteness, which we're seeing now, but really our story is about the return of this really charismatic semi-aquatic predator, a species whose presence in our waterways after a long absence is a hopeful sign of relatively healthy waterways. And this author is a mother. This is Point Reyes National Seashore in a seasonal wetland there. That wetland dries up rapidly in the summertime and the otters move around. But while it's wet, it's a great camera site for us. So part of the work we do is research, on the ground research. We count otters, we um, try to figure out how many young are, are being born each year, how many are surviving, are the numbers going up, down, staying the same. And that's important information and I'll tell you why in a few minutes. But the um, studying the otters led us to questions about their recovery and how their recovery might affect our shared watersheds and what their presence can tell us about the state of our watersheds. Now, why river otters besides the fact that they're adorable? River otters are an indicator species, meaning that their presence does tell us something about our watersheds. They disappeared from our Bay Area watersheds by the early 1900s because our watersheds were dirty. We had San Francisco Bay was a dirty mess. The water, the wetlands around the bay were being filled in and polluted. And there wasn't much prey for river otters to eat in San Francisco Bay and really all around the bay. So river otters moved and they went away, but nobody was really watching for them. In 2012, when we started our project, we realized that river otters were back because we had seen them in Lagunitas Creek where I was working on coho salmon recovery. We had seen them in Walker Creek and in Tomales Bay. We knew there were river otters seen in um, Rodeo Lagoon. So we said, all right, we have to find out what's going on here. These, are, these otters are making a comeback on their own in the San Francisco Bay area. Nobody planted them here. They're predators, they can affect other species. 
particularly endangered species like coho salmon, for example, that really um, struck me. I thought, well, if otters are returning and are critically endangered coho of salmon of Lagunitas Creek are here, are they going to eat them all? How are they going to be affected by otters? Um, and finally, we realized these otters are so charismatic. We call them our little charm bombs. And um, we thought if we can tell the story of river otters returning, if we can find out what's going on through research, if we can do education with the public and with students, and if we can use that research to support conservation, then we're going to get somewhere with these otters. So that's what we set out to do. And the first thing we wanted to find out is where are the river otters? If you look at this map, when we began our project, this was the range map for river otters in San Francisco. Everything pink was considered river otter range. And as you can see around San Francisco Bay, not very much, just a little bit in the Vallejo area and then up the, um, up the river there. And a little bit considered in San Jose, although that was a really spurious sighting, I think. It was, it was back in uh, 1963 or something. Someone thought they saw an otter print and somehow that sighting got accepted. But in any case, 2012, the range map hadn't been updated since 1995. And this is what it looked like. And we said, no, this is wrong. So we need to find the otters. And that's when we started our program called Otter Spotter. It's a community science project. Anyone can input a sighting and we encourage everyone to input sightings. Um, since then, we've had about 5,400 sightings, some mortalities, we do collect mortalities. Every yellow dot on this map is an otter sighting. The red crosses are dead otter sightings and most of them are roadkill. So we get about 600 sightings per year. And we share that information, of course, with interested parties. And this is what happened. After um, five or six years of this project in 2017, we submitted our data set to the Department of Fish and Wildlife. And we said, look, this is what we found through community science. And as a result of that, they updated the range map and they added 4,100 square miles of river otter range to their map. And most of that range, or a lot of that range, as you see, is in the San Francisco Bay Area. So who is interested in this? I mean, sure, it's interesting to know. Yes, there are lots more otters than we thought they were, there were, but who really uses that information? And the answer to that is a lot of people. We share our information wildly, wildly, widely <laughs> and wildly, and we share it with conservationists who do advocacy. Uh, we use it for our own advocacy programs. As an example, um, one of our studies is in uh, Point Reyes National Seashore. Now the cattle in the seashore often get out of where they're allowed to be and get into the wildlands. They get out of the, um, their rangelands and get into wildlands and they cause problems um, in delicate waterways. So when that happens, we find out about it, we call the agencies and we start advocating for them to, to um, fix those issues. And I'll tell you about another couple of those projects in a second. Another group that's interested is people who are in charge of restorations. A lot of the restorations around the Bay Area, as I'm sure you know, have to do with endangered species like salmon, like salt marsh harvest mouths, like um, uh, red-legged frogs, yellow-legged frogs. Those are all species that river otters are delighted to eat. So of course, we want to know when we're restoring places, what species are there. In Point Reyes National, in uh, Muir Woods and down at Muir Beach, there's been a huge and beautiful restoration done um, down at, at, at the mouth of uh, Redwood Creek at Muir Beach. And um, at the same time, the population of endangered coho salmon at Muir Beach was going down and down and down and down. So CDFW collected 
and continues to collect all of the salmon fry, the small salmon that are ready to go out to sea who have been born, and they take them up to a hatchery and they raise them at the hatchery in order to give them a better chance of survival. And then when they're ready to spawn, they bring them back to Redwood Creek and set them out. Now, obviously there are otters in Redwood Creek. So it's really important for the um, fisheries folks to understand where the otters are, about how many there are, where they're moving around the creek. And we work with them to give them that information. Um, habitat managers, of course, are interested in this um, information. Resource managers in the national, state and local parks um, are interested. Toxic spill response teams, you would never think of that really, but actually in the San Francisco Bay Area is full of, uh, of shipping lanes and train lines that take toxic chemicals all over the Bay Area. And when there's a spill, the uh, CDFW, the Oiled Wildlife Care Network, are out there trying to collect wildlife, trying to find out what happened with the spill in order to inform mitigation efforts. And for example, when the spill happened at, um, oh gosh, when was it? 2008, I think. It was a long time ago now, but I remember it. It was the uh, Costco Busan oil spill when the um, freighter hit uh, either the Bay Bridge I think it hit the Bay Bridge or the Golden Gate Bridge and oil spilled all over the Marin Headlands. So people were out there looking for oiled um, animals, but no one knew there were otters there. So there was no plan in place to look for otters, nor to find out, nor to figure out whether um, otters, the otter populations were affected by the spill. So those are the kinds of things people need to know. Of course, wildlife rehabilitators who are responsible for looking after wildlife who are injured need to know what species they need to plan for. Teachers, super interested in all of this. I do a lot of teaching and um, training teachers how to teach science. And those teachers love to look at maps like this to get the information that we have to learn about change over time. That's science, right? Looking at change over time and why things change and how they change. Um, researchers, of course, other researchers are interested. And finally, all of us, most of us want to see otters. We want to get out there and see where the otters are. So having people out there on the ground, our otter spotters are everybody, everyone can participate. That's why it's called participatory science or community science or citizen science. Everyone can send an otter spotter to us through our website. And um, that is how we got these otter sightings in San Leandro. So I, I just took a little screenshot off of, our, um, of, off of our otter spotter map on our website. If this interests you, go to our website, riverotterecology.org, go to our, um, our projects and look at otter spotter citizen science. We have maps, we have a story map. There's all kinds of ways to explore this data. And it's very fun, it's very interesting. Um, so San Leandro, here we are. Who ha has anyone here seen an otter? You can unmute yourself and speak if you would like to or put it something in the chat. Have any of you seen an otter? I see one person. Yeah, I took pictures of uh, otters at Lake Chabot. Who, who Bruce said King. that? That's Bruce, Bruce King. King. Oh, Bruce, thank you so much. So when you took photos of the otters, did you um, did you uh, put your sighting in to River Art Ecology yeah. Project? Yes. Oh, that's fabulous. Thank you. Yeah. I do have one video that was put in by Michael Hamer, I think is his name, um, which I'll show you in a second. But there, there are otters and um, Christine said she thought she saw some splashing in the back of Lake Chabot near the suspension bridge. That's very likely because look at say, Lake Chabot. There's quite a few otter sightings um, down here, quite a few near Shoreline Park, 
There's just one little sighting down here near Grant Avenue. And there's another one that you can't see well on here at Oyster Bay. So what we've discovered through Otter Spotter is that there are really river otters all over the Bay Area. It's very surprising because look how, um, how densely populated we are here. And people tend to think that river otters are um, are animals that you only see in pristine wilderness, but not so. They're surprisingly urban. Here's the video by Michael Hamer. And I'm not, I emailed him to ask him where this is, but I haven't heard back. Do any of you know where this video is? Yeah, he, he's uh, right across the creek from us on the Sheffield Village, the Oakland side of the creek in northernmost San Leandro. So okay. east of 580 is one of his dots. That, that's where they found the, uh, the carp, right there. Oh, this is the pool, the famous carp pool? Famous carp pool. Wow, that's great. And look at all these happy, healthy otters. <laughs> so it always surprises us that we see so many healthy otters in really urban places. And I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit more. I, I've seen otters at Coyote Hill. Sure. Coyote Hill in Fremont? In Fremont, I saw a whole family, family of four. Yeah, lots of otters in Fremont. Hey, Steve, it's Michael. Did you did you spot them on the site? Yes, I called it. I sent it in. I see them there about once every two years. I don't think they're resident. I think they come down Alameda Creek. Well, yeah. otters move around. Otters follow food. So today I'm going to talk to you about otter life history. And this is slow motion. I just had to show. I love this video because it, it tells you a lot about otters. Look at how long and lean they are. They don't have a lot of body fat. They have to eat a lot of food to stay warm. They hunt their mammals who hunt in the water. So they need to eat a lot to stay warm. They don't have that thick layer of blubber like a lot of marine mammals have. And look at them rolling. The rolling that they're doing in the sand, this is um, out at Abbott's Lagoon. They're rolling in the sand to do for a couple of reasons. One is to keep their fur in good shape. Um, they do a lot of grooming to keep their fur oiled up and in really good shape so they can stay warm. They also are depositing scent on the sand and they have um, scent glands in their back paws, which they deposit. And they learn a lot about each other um, at their latrine sites. And we'll talk about those in a minute, but they, they all uh, defecate in this, and pee in the same place. And it's much like a dog's, uh, uh, what's it called? A, uh, it's much the same way dogs use fire hydrants. It's a community bu bulletin board. So they get all kinds of information about um, what's going on with each other. And of course, we've never, we're not able to ask them what all information they get, but we know they get a lot from it and probably a lot more than we even think that they receive. Hmm. There we go. I'm sorry about this. I don't know why this is not doing well. Okay, Michael, did you have a question? Um, quick like life history on river otters. They're born in spring. This is the end of May. The river, most of the otters, almost all of the otters have been born at this point, but they're still tiny. They're not coming out with their mothers yet, but they will be, be in the next four to six weeks. We'll start seeing river otters coming out with their moms. They're born in a den and the moms don't dig the den. They um, they uh, find a den, they sometimes use old badger digs, they sometimes use uh, beavers bank dens, although beavers don't like that at all. Um, they, they sometimes dig under a root wad or in really thick brush and they give birth to their young. And through about eight to 16 weeks, they have to learn to swim. When they're about eight weeks old and they're able to toddle, 
to 10 weeks old, their mother starts to learn, teach them to swim. And she literally drags them to the water and forces them in and swims around with them, holding them by the neck or the leg or whatever to make sure that they they get in that water and swim. And the pups really don't want to do that. They, they would much rather stay out on the land and have their mom bring fish to them. But they don't. They have to learn to swim and dive. So they do that. And here's a photo, a video from one of our sites of a little pup. This is the end of June. So this is a pretty young pup hanging out with mom. They're very dependent upon their mothers for everything and they stick to them like glue. When they're born, their eyes are closed. They can't, um, they can't uh, as I said, they can't swim. They can't catch their own food. So their mom has to um, bring them fish in the den and then after um, they're big enough like this she's teaching her pup everything she has to teach these little mammals how to hunt in the water they have to learn how to hunt um, underwater and they have to learn what food is good what food that they can eat and what doesn't work for them there's another video from the same place this is a couple years ago That's a mother and her helper female. Um, female otters hang out together often and sometimes with their, um, their associated pups. So sometimes there'll be two or three moms with their associated pups. Usually those females are related. When the pups are little, males are not invited. So the males disappear when the pups, when the female is pregnant, there she is helping her baby that little one across. The um, females, the males disappear and are not invited back until um, the pups are much older in the fall. Usually the males can come back and they'll hang out. But in general, uh, the two sexes don't hang out a lot together. <laughs> I love that video. The only time they hang out together is during mating, which we'll see in a moment. Now, river otters are extremely agile on land, unlike sea otters, very different from sea otters. River otters can climb cliffs like this cliff at Sea Ranch. And look, there, she's dragging that little one right up the cliff. That's the mom in the front and the little ones are following her and there's a helper female behind giving them a boost up the hill. I was really amazed when I saw this video to see how brave those little ones are to climb that very steep cliff, but they do just fine. They climb trees, river otters in zoos often, <laughs> they have to keep the trees trimmed in river otter zoo enclosures because they'll climb the tree and they'll get out and go walk about all the time if they can. They're very curious animals. So dispersal, when they're, when they're about 14 months or older, um, some of them disperse, they go um, exploring. The, they're both sexually mature at one to three years old. And females are sexually mature at one year old, but they don't usually breed until they're at least two years old. And I think part of that is because they're still with their moms until they're at least one. And then it takes them some time to um, get situated. The males um, don't usually breed until they're three, four, five years old. And that's because they have a baculum, which is a penis bone, and it has to grow large enough for them to be able to um, mate with the females. So that takes a little time. And the males usually will hang out with their moms until they're about one, and then they might disperse or they might stay longer. Whether the pups disperse or not really seems to depend more upon the availability of good habitat and food. If the food and habitat situation isn't great, then they'll take off. But we've seen um, many groups hanging out together for years at a time. And here is river otter mating. And they mate in the water and they go on land to rest. Mating takes two or three days usually. Um, this is a 
surprisingly quiet <laughs> mating event. Usually there's a lot of screaming and the female will try to get away from the male. They don't seem to really love it. Although this one is pretty quiescent about it, but a lot of time there's screeching and yelling. And that's when the people who have river otters uh, denning under their boathouses get upset and call me and say, they're fighting, they're screaming. No, they're really not fighting. They're actually probably mating. And the interesting thing about that is when the female has pups in the den, the two weeks after she bears young, she goes into estrus again. So she is very likely, if she's already had pups, to have pups in the den and also be getting her egg fertilized for the next year. And think of the energetic needs that have to do with that. I mean, here's a female, she has a little pup, she's having to go hunt for them, bring food back to them or nurse them. And she has this male that she's mating with for several days at a time. It's pretty tough, but the female otters seem to deal with it quite well. They don't, they don't generally look thin or unhealthy or anything. They do, they, um, do great. So mating. So now we're going to skip ahead to their life, their life, the gestation period. Someone asked about that is, um, this is what I'm just getting to. So what happens is that the females get pregnant, but they have delayed implantation, like a lot of marine mammals have. And we're not sure why. Delayed implantation means that they're, they go into heat, they, um, they, uh, they, uh, their egg is fertilized, but it doesn't implant in their uterus right away and start growing. Instead, it just stays there and hangs out for about 10 months, and then it implants and starts growing, and then there's about two months of um, active pregnancy that the, that the females have. So it's really interesting. We don't really know why that happens with um, otters. There, there, is, there are two thoughts about that. One is that the females are easier to find for the males when they have pups in the den. So they can find them um, and, and procreate with them at that time more easily than when the females are running around. I don't really put a lot of faith into, the, into that idea because we've been watching the same otters in the same places for many, many years. And the males know where the females are. They always know where they are. And they, they know what their range is and their territories. So I suspect that's not quite right. But the other possibility is that this is an old, um, uh, an old strategy from millennia ago that has kind of hung on through, um, through the DNA and it's still there. And I, I think that seems a little more likely, but no one really knows the answer to that. So I'm ready to hear differently at any time. There's so much about river otters that we don't yet know, so much research that needs to happen and um, not nearly enough time to do it all. So the lifespan of an otter in the wild, it's, it's not an easy life for these animals. They have to eat a lot. They, um, they have to catch a lot of prey. They have to eat it. They have to stay healthy. It's about 10 to 12 months. And they, I mean years, sorry, 10 to 12 years. And they don't breed every year. They breed maybe every other year, sometimes every year, but um, they can easily take a year off if they need to energetically or for other reasons. This is a very old otter and she was hanging out for a long time on the coast. And I think her fur is white for two reasons. One is that she is old and otters do get gray when they get old, just like the rest of us. But the other reason is because the salt spray and the salt air, if you're living at the coast, really seems to make a difference. But she is an exceptionally pale otter. And this was an old girl. I saw some photos of her teeth when her mouth was open and the poor little thing, her teeth were almost worn to nubs. And I think for a lot of otters, as they get older, they are not able to hunt nearly as well as they could before. Of course, the biggest, um, Dale, I don't think they do. I, do they twin, you're asking? Do, are you asking if they have more than one pup at a time, Dale? 
Yeah. Yes, they do. They usually have three or four pups. Um, they can have anywhere from two to six, usually three, two, three, four, maybe, but um, yes, lots of, lots of pups. They're very attentive mothers. So what do river otters eat? The perennial question. And that's a really fun question to look into and answer. We did that um, as a group with high school students a few years ago, we did a prey study. And what we discovered was really interesting. River otters, because they need so many calories to keep in good shape, they will eat any meat that is easy to catch and slow. We heard about carp eat earlier today, and a lot of us have heard about the koi getting killed and eaten. So those are slow fish, they're easy to catch and they're big. So of course they make a great meal for an otter. So do rays like this thornback ray. This um, female otter was living at um, Drake's Bay for many years, may, may still be there as far as I know. She um, had pups every year, beautiful, healthy pups, and she was always bringing huge meals back for them, including rays, including sharks. Yes, indeed. She would go out and she caught, we, someone um, put in an otter spotter and said, I saw a river otter carrying a shark out from the ocean. And we thought, really? And it was a, it, and then we looked on our camera. We happened to have a camera up right there, and we saw a big fight going on in the culvert near where the camera was. And a few minutes later, we saw on our on our camera this otter carrying half a shark out of the culvert because she had caught it, and it made a great feast for her young. But that's not. Oh, and this one is good. Do otters eat salmon? You bet they do. They can get them. That's an otter with a steelhead. They're really capable, they're tiny. They're very small animals. They weigh about 20 pounds and their little, their heads are small and um, they're incredibly muscular and they have an amazing bite. So they can just crunch almost anything. Nobody wants to get in a fight with an otter. They're about three and a half feet long, um, but skinny, they're little water weasels. These are the few, a few of the things otters love to eat. We talked about sharks. They definitely go after leopard sharks that are bigger than they are. Um, they, eat, they eat pelicans. Fascinating. At Abbott's Lagoon, they have been eating brown pelicans at, with great um, delight and alacrity for the past several years. It happened at Rodeo Lagoon. Some of you, if you're birders, may remember that back in uh, the early 2000s, river otters were eating a lot of brown pelicans at Rodeo Lagoon and people got really upset about it. And it happened for a couple of years and then the brown pelicans changed their habits and stopped hanging out where the river otters are. River otters are still there, but they're not getting pelicans at that great rate. And it's very interesting. It seems to be happening now at Abbott's Lagoon. So we, um, River Otter Ecology is doing a study this summer on um, how, their, how their predation affects the, the pelicans at Abbott's Lagoon. Very, very fun stuff. I can't wait to see what we find out. So pelicans, big animals, they also eat stuff that's easy to catch like crayfish. They are huge munchers of crayfish. If they can um, catch crayfish easily, they'll eat almost only crayfish. We did a study in Martinez, in Martinez for a little while at a couple of wetlands, and there were tons and tons of um, red swamp crayfish there, just tons. And that was pretty much all the otters there ate. So it, it made an interesting um, change in our prey study because the otters out there just ate crayfish, whereas the otters in Point Reyes were eating um, all kinds of things seasonally. And here, here's a happy otter with a crayfish. I love this photo. So get a look at those whiskers. That otter, what do otters use those whiskers for? Anyone have a guess? <laughs> Anyone, I guess? What about those thick, thick whiskers? They're very sensitive whiskers. That's exactly right, Christine. Um, 
to sense things. And part of the part of the issue with hunting underwater is that the water can be murky, it can be dark, it can be turbid, it can be really hard to see their prey underwater. Those whiskers are so sensitive that they can pick up ripples and they, they can sense when there's food around and they can go right to it. So otters use those um, whiskers as a sensing device. More, um, more animals that river otters eat, pretty much, pretty much any meat they can get their teeth around, including gulls, coots, grebes, scoters, cormorants, geese, and pelicans. Geese less often than other creatures. And I think that's because, I think I think that because I'm scared of geese. <laughs> but otters don't seem to mess with them too often. Although if, if they're hungry, they will go after pretty much anything. Um, I have seen them catch gulls quite often and also uh, coots and grebes sometimes. And they have different um, ways of catching those animals. They're very stealthy under the water. So they'll swim under the water. They'll go under the animal while it's sitting on the pond, floating on the pond. And if it's a, I've seen them catch gulls by hooking an arm across the gull neck and then grabbing them by the neck and towing them onto the land to eat. Um, I've seen them catch pelicans by grabbing their feet from under the water. And when the pelican puts his head down, they drown them. It's really quite awful and not fun to see. And I always have to remind myself, circle of life, circle of life. But, you know, biologists are, some of us anyway are still horrified by things like that. It's really tough to see, but they need the, they definitely need the food. So here's some of the other food that um, otters eat. There's, there's a carp um, carcass that was in uh, Giacomini wetlands in Point Reyes. Lots and lots of these little tiny mole crabs that are found on the beaches all over the place. Um, green crabs, which are an invasive species. Um, lots of lots and lots of um, of little uh, water in insects like this dragonfly nymph, and interestingly, we collected one of the scats that we collected was absolutely chock full of ladybug wings because apparently the uh, otter had found a bush full of ladybugs hanging out and just chomped it. It's really interesting. Um, I hadn't realized that they would do that. Do you have any questions at this point about what I've said so far? Okay, we'll, we'll come back at the end. There will be lots of time. Um, social life. River otters are very, very social and their middle name is adaptability. They will literally adapt to anything. If they have a place to live, if they have enough food to eat, if they have relatively clean water. They need fresh water um, to drink and for their fur, unlike uh, sea otters. There's the babies coming out of the pipe. River otters will use um, the, the things that people build in all kinds of ways. This mother, this is the Contra Costa Canal. It looks like somewhere where river, river otters would not be happy. Look at, look at how channelized it is. It's all concrete. That habitat looks absolutely awful. And yet there is a very, very happy um, uh, several groups of otters living and hunting and doing just fine in Contra Costa Canal. And they are actually just fine in cities as long as they can find food and have enough habitat to hang out in, they're, they're good. They're not that picky, <laughs> river otters are not picky. This is a group of most likely males. It's hard to tell them their anatomy um, because it's, it's quite hidden. But when, they're, when they are around a female who's in heat, sometimes their testes become very big. And that's generally the only way. Some kind, sometimes you, you can tell if it's a female, if she's got young with her, obviously that's, that's a female. But these are most likely a group of males. So the males also tend to have bigger, thicker necks and stronger shoulders than the female, just a little bit bigger in general. But there's, um, there's a lot of, uh, variation in that as well. 
I love, I love this photo of this happy group of males. So if you see a group of 11 or 12 or more otters, it's most likely a group of males hanging out together. And again, um, the females don't hang out with them except to mate, unless they're young um, females, sometimes they'll hang out with males too, but for the most part, um, the sexes are different. And yes, they are just playing Christina. They love to play. They're one of, that's part of why they're so much fun to watch because even the adults love to play. They play, they mutually groom each other. Um, they just always seem to be having such a good time. This is a really interesting video. Um, my friend Karen James took this. She's been watching the river otters in the Contra Costa Canal for years and she knows them better, I think, than almost anybody. And she was watching these two different groups of otters who didn't really know each other. And she managed to catch this video of them meeting for the first time. It's very interesting to me because you can see these are neighbors, but they don't really normally hang out together. And they're curious, but wary. not fighting, but lot, lots of touching and feeling and sniffing and getting a sense of the other. So there's some submissiveness going on there and some play as well. So I'm very curious about this. I, I don't know everything about this interaction, but it's not Normally, if river otters know each other, they just come up and immediately start playing around together or ignore each other or whatever. But this interaction was really super interesting. Um, and I hope we get lots more of this this year. So predators, river otters do have predators in the San Francisco Bay Area, although not too many of them. And this bobcat was hanging around. Is that um, this is one of our camera sites? See this beautiful cat, and you hear squeaking. Did you see that? So the otter wasn't having it. So river otters and bobcats are approximately the same weight. And river, I would never, if I were a bobcat, I wouldn't go near a river otter. That bobcat skedaddled quickly because that was a mom with her pretty big pup. So that was at the end of October in 2018, and the pups were pretty big by then, but the mother was still very protective of her young. And that continues. Um, family groups are protective of each other in general. So off went that. And this one I just put in because it is such a beautiful vi video of a relative of river otters. This is in the mustelid family, which rivers, uh, river otters are too. And it's an American badger hanging out. One of our uh, <laughs> one of our um, volunteers was out checking a camera, and he found this badger dig. So he just set up a camera, and here comes the badger to check it out. Um, again, river otters will use old badger digs. I've never heard of badgers and river otters fighting at all, or even mixing it up, or at all. I think they would avoid each other. River, uh, adult male river otters will avoid each other too, rather than fight if they can. They occasionally do fight, um, territorial fighting during, uh, during mating season, but usually they practice avoidance rather than fighting. Ah. <laughs> and this is, again, now I'm, I am, um, I'm heading out a little bit from river otters at this moment because this is fabulous. This was in Marin up in our reservoirs. We've known for years that there's been one bear in Marin and that one bear had been seen for many years. But on our trail camera, we caught these two young bears playing in the summer of 22. And those bears, I live in Forest Knolls, which is really near here. And the bears um, have been seen several times in my town. 
the two, the, the one bear was seen in my town, but now we think there are three bears in Marin. So <laughs> it's fabulous. I love getting these, these uh, wild predators back into Marin. It's, it's a really good sign for everyone. The pairs seem happy. They get seen once in a while, but they ha there haven't been any problems with them or anything like that. One of our volunteers, um, Peter Bartow, is part of the North Bay Bear Collective, and they are collecting scat and information on um, the bears in Marin County and in the North Bay in general. How about that? <laughs> So we saw those bears near our camera uh, for um, a couple days and then they moved on and we haven't seen them at our camera since. But our cameras are only out from um, June through October, November. So if they were there in the winter, we missed them. Now, this is one of the most interesting videos we have ever got from our trail cameras. And one of the lasting joys of doing this kind of research is having a whole bunch of trail cameras out and capturing all kinds of um, wildlife interactions. So this one is a, a rabbit. You can see the brush rabbit down here and look what's by him, a big gopher snake. Does anyone know what that behavior is all about? I didn't know. When I saw this, I said, what is going on? Why is that rabbit aggressing the snake in that way? And I called one of my friends who knows about rabbits. And she told me, absolutely, Kayla, you're exactly right. She said the gopher snakes will go after the rabbit's babies. And she very likely had little bunnies nearby. So the minute I heard that, I went out to that site and looked around. And sure enough, I found rabbit pellets in some riprap very close to that area. So I think that mother bunny was telling the gopher snake to get out. So really, what a brave bun. Oh yeah, we can see it one more time. <laughs> what about river otters and coyotes? Do they predate? Well, coyotes will certainly go after river otter pups if they can, but I don't think I would want to mess with this crew of river otters behind this coyote. And this happened at, at my um, site. And thank goodness, a wonderful photographer, Fish Carney, was there and took a whole series of photos of this interaction. The otters had caught a whole bunch of um, coots and they had stashed them in the lagoon right in front of this coyote. And the coyote was watching. So what did it do? It decided it would share. So the coyote went down and it started, started pulling coots out of the um, lagoon and eating them. And the river otters were not at all pleased by this. So look how tiny they are compared to the coyote. And yet they're not having it. First they came down and started eating the coots themselves. And then the coyote continued his behavior. So the matriarch otter chased the coyote away. And just the relative size of those two creatures is so interesting to me. I have actually seen um, on our trail cameras an otter chase off two coyotes at once because the coy they, they live in a really interesting, they have a very interesting relationship. They know each other as neighbors and they're wary of each other. They're, they're not going to I have also seen them play a little bit too, which is <laughs> very interesting, but they're, they're just kind of neighbors who don't mess with each other too much if they can help it, but they will also steal if they can. So this was interesting. Um, Bill Barrett was down near the mouth of the Russian with his camera and he happened to see a bald eagle um, coming in and trying to steal this otter's fish. You see that fish at the base of the rock. Otters will bring large prey up onto rocks or onto the shore to eat them. And the eagle was being an eagle. 
and the otter wasn't having it. Look at that body. Look at how strong that river otter is. It's holding, it's almost the length of his body. That's about two feet out of the water. And look how strong the shoulders are. He's ready to take on that eagle, which has a wingspan of about six feet, five, six feet. The, it's much bigger than the otter, but otters don't care. <laughs> and so here's the otter climbing up onto the on onto the rock to make sure the eagle leaves. And the eagle did end up leaving, but the otter ended up leaving up as well and leaving the fish behind. But it, the eagle never did get the fish. So I wonder if the otter came back later to get it. Very interesting. So um back to hang on a second. There we go. Um River Otter Ecology Project has discovered through Otter Spotter that river otters are surviving and thriving throughout the Bay Area. The only place we don't find them is the coast south of San Francisco. And there's plenty of habitat there for them. We've done lots of surveys down there, but we haven't found them. Um, we have people watching for them. But we do see otters in places like Concord and um, even San Francisco. There was an otter in San Francisco. When we first started our project, there was an otter at, um, at the Headlands in San Francisco, and it's hung out there for a while. We think it swam across the bay to, and visited the city for a while. But they're, they can be a very urban animal. We've seen them in Lake Merritt. We've seen them in Tilden. Um, we've seen them all over, really. It's, a, it's amazing how many otters that there are in the Bay Area. And they're doing well. Um, Christine, yes, they are on the Bay side of the peninsula, but we don't see them as often. They are there, but we don't see them as much as we'd like to. The farther south that we, river otters sighting that we've had was a little bit south of San Jose. So that's pretty far south. Um, and we're just waiting for those otters to get across to the coast because river otters love to be coastal animals. They can catch really big fish in the ocean and it, it's a nice place for them to be. So, and they're not afraid of waves. They don't mind big waves. They're fine with that. So we'll see how, how soon they get out to the coast from the South Bay. Um, oh, yes. So community conservation is what we're using Otter Spotter now. We wish, for, we wish to use the charm of river otters to help people understand how to um, conserve their, their local neighborhoods where they're seeing otters. Here's a guy on the park bench in this pretty um, suburban urban park. And he's got his little dog on, the, on his lap. He's doing exactly what he should do, keeping his dog by him, not bugging the otter. The otter is doing its thing, fishing just like he is. And um, we, start, we decided to start a program to help people photograph and um, recreate and watch wildlife in a more um, sustainable fashion than happens. A lot of times otters are bothered by people because they get so excited and they just wanna hang out and get good pictures and selfies and all of that. And we wanna avoid um, having real problems with river otters. So we started a program called Otter Ambassadors. Um, our friends and our volunteers in Contra Costa started it last year and they started just walking around where the otters are being seen and talking to people about them and about conservation and about how important clean watersheds are to all of us, including the otters and, and um, helping people understand how to get good wildlife photos, not by going up to the animal and frightening it away or disturbing it, but by sitting back and really enjoying the experience. And um, here's that famous otter in Lake Merritt. A couple of times we've had otters in Lake Merritt. They don't stay long. I don't think it's a very inviting place for them. There are too many people, really. There are too many people there. And I think um, they go back out into the bay, but they do visit sometimes. But again, river otters are um, using areas like the Contra Costa Canal to catch this huge striped bass. Look at that. 
astonishing. So she was pulling that striped bass up. So she's using that pipe that, you know, this is human stuff that she's using much to her, um, to help her to hang out and eat that bass inside the pipe where she'll be safe. And we saw earlier, she was stashing her babies in there earlier. So river otters are very smart and adaptable animals. And as long as they have food and reasonable enough um, habitat, they do just fine. And I like this because it really illustrates why we need otter ambassadors. This otter was a mother. She had pups in her den, which is over to the right if you're facing her. And she got this fish and she was trying to take it back to her den, trying and trying, but people were excited to see her and they weren't letting her pass. They were, they were getting too close. They were trying to get photos and they couldn't do it. So she ended up, I think she ended up going back to the pond at that time. And she, you know, she did end up being fine, but this is the kind of thing we really want to avoid if we can, if we can. And so it's one of the, one of the things we're teaching with our otter ambassadors. Yeah, she did finally get across. <laughs> <laughs> They're very determined. And finally, speaking of playing. They're using the ladder as a jungle gym. <laughs> and see, they're doing their mutual grooming, keeping their fur in good shape, playing with each other, socializing. People are excited, you can hear them. So if that's not a reason to keep our watersheds in good shape, I don't know what is. They're pretty adorable and fun. And here they go off into the future. Now I am um, going to finish up in a second, but I wanna answer a couple of questions first and let me just look through. Betsy was asking how do river otters compare to sea otters? That's a and that's a great question. They're, they're different species. They're, in, they're um, all otters. We have 13 species of otters in the world. And the only ones we have in North America are sea otters and river otters. And do we have sea otters in the San Francisco Bay Area? Not really. They're in Central California. And then we don't see them again until you get up into um, Washington and um, and then all the way up into Canada and Alaska. But um, sea otters are very different. They can spend their whole lives in the ocean. They never need to come to, um, they never need to come to land. They do not need to drink fresh water as river otters do. They weigh 65 or more pounds. They're huge. We, we usually see them from pretty far away. So I think we often think they're smaller than they are, but sea otters are very, very big animals. They're about the size of a German shepherd, if you think about it, 65 pounds, that's a big sea otter. And uh, what else about them? Sea otters are the ones that lie on their back in the ocean and hold hands and wrap their, um, their babies or their hands in kelp to stay in the same place. Um, they are very clumsy on land. They look nothing like river otters. They have short stubby tails, big back legs that are um, webbed and allow them to swim really well in the water. But little front, um, their little front paws are not webbed, but they have sharp claws. And sea otters are the ones that use tools. They um, bang things on rocks in order, they bang um, shells on rocks in order to open them up and so on. So sea otter is very different. River, river, oh, the sea otters also 
interestingly, and this is part of why they were almost extinct, is that they have the thickest fur known on, on the planet, very, very thick. River otter's fur is thick also, and river otters were extinct in some areas, especially in the Midwest, um, by the 1800s because they had been trapped out for their fur, which was half the thickness of sea otter fur. But they were trapped. There were so many more of them that they were. They became their uh, river otter fur became the standard, so called, for um, fur bearers, and so they were trapped out much too much. Thankfully, in San Francisco, in uh, California, it's illegal to hunt, um, to trap river otters or any other mammal. So yay for that. And that has helped with their, um, with them recovering in the area. Okay, questions. More questions. Dozens of sea otters in Morro Bay. Absolutely, they're so much fun. How far do the pups disperse? This is a great question, um, Maddie. How far do the pups disperse from the mom when they leave? That really vary, varies. They disperse however far they want to. It could be just um, to the next watershed. It could be just up the river a little bit, um, or it could be further. They, dis they disperse to where they find either food or, um, or love. They generally um, disperse for either food or territory or habitat. So it really depends. And that's a great question. And there's a lot of information we don't have yet about river otters. I'd love to have the funding to do all the research we'd love to do with them, but it doesn't happen. That's OK. So I'm looking at more questions. What's what about that population east of Fresno? Well, river otters are pretty common um, in the mountains and the foothills, all the way down to Fresno, actually, a little bit south of Fresno. River otters are commonly there. They don't really, ex their population doesn't seem to have extended too much further south than that. So they don't have them in LA, but um, definitely as far south as Fresno. Someone asked about scat. I hear it is a different way to ID. Um, are you, um, Steve, are you asking about genetics? No, no I, I've heard that th their scat is, the way they poop is different than everybody else. And if you see that in the wild, it, it's different than other scat. Oh, well, it is it is different. And trust me, I've collected enough of it. <laughs> so I, I know what it's like. It smells different and it looks, it can look very different. But just like everything else about river otters, it's um the the way their scat looks can be really different. Um it can be everything from a little puddle of of uh gelatinous stuff, which is called otter jelly. It's something that um is that happens in their intestines and it's supposedly it's there to help protect their intestines from sharp shells and bones. Um, it can also be full of crayfish, but the scat, um, so otter scat can also look a lot like raccoon scat. So if raccoons and otters have both been eating crayfish and the scat they scat right next to each other. It can be really hard to tell which is which, except by smell. There, there's an odor that otter scat has that's very fishy and musky, and it's not at all like raccoon scat. Um, but I don't suggest that anyone sticks their nose into anybody's scat. It's kind of gross. <laughs> <laughs> I'm at Coyote Hills about three times a week, and I was hoping that you'd have a trick for identifying otters. Uh, for me uh, by scat. Otter scat? Well, in Coyote Hills, I, I have been to that park and found um, otter scat all along the paths there. So if you're seeing it all along the paths, it's more likely otter scat than raccoon scat because otters tend to poop right when they get out of the water. So if they're coming out and they're coming across a path, they might very well leave, uh, leave a scat sample there. Whereas raccoons are much, much more likely to poop at a latrine site. Um, 
again, eh, you kind of have to smell it <laughs> to know for sure. But uh, raccoons also often have vegetation or seeds or nuts or you know other things in their scat because they're omnivores. Whereas river otters um, will always have either fish or crayfish or bird feathers in their scat. You mentioned uh, carp. Are, are the carp mating right now? I'm seeing a lot of carp activity. I don't know. Do we have any carp experts here? I have no idea. They're thrashing around and making, you know, coming halfway out of the water. That sounds like mating behavior, but I really don't know. Um, the naturalist I, there can't tell me. <laughs> oh, they don't know either? No. I Google it. Google carp mating. You're, okay. You're sure to find videos. All right. What else do we have? Okay, Beth is asking more about how river otters are an indicator species. What indications of health or not do they demonstrate? Well, river otters' presence um, indicates that the waters and the and the habitat is reasonably good. That doesn't mean it's pristine or perfect by a long shot. River otters are tough animals, and they can put up with a lot of um, pollution um, and and toxic. Uh, waters around them, as long as they can get enough food to survive, and as long as they can, as long as that food is relatively clean. And the reason I keep say, saying relatively sort of kind of is because not very much um, research has been done on levels of toxics in river otter, um, in river otter tissues. So we don't really know. Our thought is that because when streams and San Francisco Bay, for example, and our streams were filthy and dirty, um, river otters disappeared. And that's happened all over the country. And it was thought that river otters would just not survive at all unless the water was pretty pristine and their habitat was pretty pristine. But I think that's not quite right. And we're learning more all the time. But um, as far as an indicator species, they have to have enough enough food to stay healthy. Lots of different species is good for river otters. Um, it's great if they don't have to depend on one species to survive, although they will if they have to, but it's better for them to have a range of species. Um, so, so river otters are indicators of watershed shed health and the um, same, the same uh, conditions that keep us healthy keep river otters healthy. So we're very connected in that way as are most, as is most wildlife. Oh, Dale, the highest elevation they've been spotted. I don't know the answer to that. That's a great question. I know they're, they're seen um, up in, uh, up at uh, Lake Tahoe. So certainly that, that high they've been. I don't know what the highest elevation they've ever been seen at, though. I'm going to have to look that up. Christine has her hand raised. Christine? Hi, I just started typing. It's sometimes easier for me to just talk. Um, I missed at the beginning you were saying something about the salmon and, how you know, the endangered salmon and the otters coming back. Um, I love that you what were you, that. What were you saying? Talk well, the, the reason um, it's actually it's actually why we started our project because um, we were working with endangered salmon in Lagunitas Creek in Marin County. We have a population of critically endangered coho salmon, one of the most important populations in um, Central California. So we were working on salmon recovery, and we started seeing the otters, and we said, "Oh, what does this mean?" And that's how our project began. And one of the things that we've discovered a couple of things about otters, I mean, yeah, otters, otters and salmon. 
Um, salmon bring, when salmon come in to spawn from the ocean, they bring nutrients from the ocean that aren't found inland, except when they're brought in by the salmon. So the salmon spawn and then they die and they, um, they fertilize the creek, they fertilize uh, other animals, eat their carcasses, they take them and they poop in the woods, they fertilize the woods that way, and they bring in nutrients that wouldn't be there otherwise. Interestingly, river otters do the same. They're out there, they're hunting in the ocean, they're hunting in the waters, they're bringing in nutrients um, and pooping on the banks. And there have been some um, studies done that show that banks where river otters are pooping a lot are more nutrient full and have um, better plant vegetation covers than others. So that's interesting. The other thing river otters do that's very interesting is eat all the crayfish they can get their teeth around. And here in the Bay Area, most of our crayfish are um, either red swamp or signal crayfish, which are not native, and they tend to eat the baby salmon. So in Lagunitas Creek, we have lots and lots of crayfish, and they go after small fish, like little tiny salmon who can't protect themselves or get away from them very easily. But when we have river otters coming in here and chowing down on the, um, on the uh, crayfish, well, that's interesting. What a web. So there, there are, but at the same time, river otters will certainly take salmon if they can, as we saw in the earlier video. So it's a complicated web we've got going on here. And I think with that. Why do you, why do you think they don't go into Southern California? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it's too hot. I think basically it's 